Okay, so um, we're going to look today at humanism. Let's start this off. One person, not the same person, one person, what goes here? First paradigm of European psychology. Sorry? One. Bund, yeah. Yes, Bund. Remember in German, W's are pronounced as B's. Good idea to say his name. Wilhelm Bund. <laughs> Wilhelm Bund. Or you can say Wilhelm Bund. It's whatever. So, and he goes down here in. Who is. American pragmatism. Who goes here? Who's the father of American psychology? Who said James. William James? Eric. Ooh, yes, I remember James. And meanwhile, at the same time, who's doing this? Uh, this. Uh, Thing outside of academic psychology, another kind of psychology. Go ahead, Freud. Freud and psychoanalysis. These are the currents. Good job. Boy, I'm happy. And then in the US, one of Titchener's. That's why I shouldn't go on Jeopardy. What is this? There's another school of thought. One of one students comes by and says, "Structuralism." And, and what's his name? Yeah, you got it. Structuralism. And that's that. Anyone know where he is? He taught. Was it Cornell? You got it. You got it. And psychoanalysis continues to today. The others have kind of morphed into structuralism dies off, and what takes over, what becomes the next dominant paradigm in the United States. The thing we studied last week. He, who said this? Behaviorism. Behaviorism, John D. Watson. And anyone else know the year of the Behaviorist Manifesto that he wrote? We looked at that. John D. Watson, we looked at that last week. 1913. Then, in Germany and Europe, there's this other current going that in Europe they're very skeptical of behaviorism. That was an American and British thing. We call that uh, Anglo-American, British-American philosophy. This book about behaviorism. But in Germany, there was this other type of psychology going on called where we studied a few weeks ago. Anyone remember? These guys left and came to the United States fleeing Nazism. They just taught at different universities, Bryn Mawr, U School, and uh, Smith College. What did you say? Gestalt. Gestalt. Got it. And the, the uh, Gestalt movement paradigm. Max Bertheimer is the big name of that. And in the United States, we're going to study today. In the United States, we have something brewing called the third force psychology. Third force. The third force psychology eventually it was initially called third force psychology. It then became known as humanism in the United States. And it was a reaction, as we're going to learn today, against psychoanalysis and behaviorism, which were the only two options in top psychology at this time. You went to academic university, you studied behaviorism. Why? 
my, and this was true up until the 1960s, it's not until 1960s, the early 1960s, as we'll learn next week, that we have the cognitive revolution, and cognitive psychology becomes the predominant par paradigm of doing psychology through, and today in the field, we learn mostly about cognitive academic psychology. And that was displaced, which I'll tell you about in our final, true final lecture, with the latest paradigm, which is neuroscience. Right? That caught on about 10 years ago, and now that started to get a little shape. It's not as popular as it once was. Each one of these things becomes extremely popular. People say, this is it. This is where we put all our research energy in. It gets exhausted, and then something new comes about. So that's why I always tell students I saw paradigm shift a couple times, but once with the, my doctoral dissertation, I should probably, I'll talk about this next week in depth, but my doctoral dissertation was entitled Post-Cognitive Negation. That was the first title of it. What that meant was post-cognitive negation, post-cognitive negation means Post means after, cognitive means cognitive psychology. So post-cognitive negation refers to the question in my dissertation was, what does a psychology of the future look like? The post-cognitive psychology, the psychology after cognitive psychology. And as you can probably see, each of these kind of negates the thing that comes before it, the Hegelian concept. So um, the ideas are set here and then this paradigm negates the previous paradigm. As we're going to see today, negate means it disagrees with, it negates it, it's negative, against it. Positive, negative, <laughs> negative, an idea plus the negative side, that's the cognitive negation. So uh, it turns out that, at least for a little while, I think neuroscience has, hasn't necessarily negated psychology, I guess now they kind of have, the two have become absorbed into one another, cognitive and neuroscience. But nevertheless, we'll talk about that next week. Is everybody good? Everybody, this is seared into your, into your noggin. Thank you. Uh, that's seared into your noggin. Well, today we talked about existential phenomenological psychology, like big words. In the US, it has a much easier discussion called humanism. So, uh, I guess it would be a good idea to sketch out a little bit of what this is about. The behavior, the psychologists of the time. The behaviorism was, in the United States and in England, was the dominant way of doing psychology. When my best friend's mother went to college, she studied psychology. She graduated in 69, started college in 65. And she studied undergrad degree in psych. She studied four years of reward and punishment schedule and class organization. That was psychology. She got bored with it and decided not to go on and get a master's degree and PhD studying more reward and punishment schedules, more Skinner. It wasn't until, you see, when someone's a professor teaching a class in the 1960s, she had professors who probably got their PhDs, unless they were freshly minted PhDs, she had her professors probably graduated with their doctorates at least 20 years before, which would have been in the 1940s. So they were trained as behaviorists. You see, paradigms don't shift because people change their minds. Behaviorists, as we're going to find out next week in cognitive psychology, when the revolution of cognitive psychology happened, the behaviorists didn't say, oh, we've been wrong, <laughs> and change their mind and suddenly become cognitive psychologists. Paradigms don't shift that way. They 
shifts. It happens because a generation of professors retire and a new generation comes up. It's really a lot to do with retirement. People don't change their minds too easily. Some do. Those who change their mind start calling themselves stuff like cognitive behaviorists, adopting the behaviorist because that's what their doctorates are in and their research is in, but they adopt the new dumb paradigm coming up. Just like today, you have cognitive neuroscientists, largely cognitive people that were PhDs in the 80s and 90s, and maybe early 2000s, who have want to remain relevant by adapting to the outcome. It's interesting, we get this idea that academics, or maybe if we use that term scientist, I'd say academics, researchers, and professors, and thinkers, we get this idea that um, they're looking for something that if, they, if their idea is disproved or if they find evidence against it, they give up their ideas and move on to the next thing. We kind of think that's the way idealistically it all works. But in reality, as Thomas Kuhn showed us, it doesn't work that way. It has more to do with retirement. And usually that retirement is forced. Enough people, the younger generation of professors, get hired in. And you have a dwindling amount of people who had their education 40 years earlier, who are then encouraged to retire and make room for new, younger people. And those new, younger people are trained in the newer paradigm. It's very fascinating to think about things this way. Yeah. So, with humanism, third force psychology, you had psychologists, mostly psychotherapists, clinical psychologists, counselors who were not very convinced by behaviorism. Behaviorism works really well for nonverbal, low-functioning diagnoses. It works really well, apparently, for modifying behavior in addictions treatment. It seems behavior therapy seems to work really well in like social skills and teaching people how to act and teaching people to stop at the stop sign. Behaviorism reward and punishment schedules are very good at things like this. Now, just because someone stops at the stop signs doesn't necessarily mean that they have some sort of ethical or moral belief system that compels them to stop there because that feels, as Kohlberg says in his model of ethics, and morality, because that feels that's the right thing to do, that they would stop even if there weren't a punishment for running the stop sign. Behaviorism doesn't get into that kind of stuff. Behaviorism simply operates on the level of behavior. Someone stops because not necessarily it's right or wrong, but they stop because they avoid punishment. <laughs> this is the, the great critique of behaviorism by a clockwork orange. It's also one of the main arguments today about when you have laws legislating like a behavioristic law, legislation against saying hate speech or uh, discriminating uh, to students or to employees or anyone renting an apartment, discrimination. Um, just because one is abiding the law or obeying the, the legal issue and not saying racist or sexist or ageist or whatever is terms or things are done discriminating against their students or their professors or whatever, the law is protected. It doesn't mean it's not that their heart is in that place. It kind of creates a phony world. That's the criticism of behaviorism. It creates a world where everybody's acting politely and not saying nasty things to one another, and then underneath it boils up with an anger and resentment of being, uh, having that being compelled to act in a certain way. We have this in, in our life, in your lifetime, we have this with the political correct, this is the criticism of the PC movement. Unfortunately, what psychoanalysis tells us is when you keep people from expressing themselves, it doesn't change the way their hearts feel, and it eventually bubbles up and boils up, and then it explodes. And when it explodes, you know what happens. You hear, you read about this on the explosions that take place, emotional explosions. 
So behaviorism, the critique of behaviorism is this is not deep enough. It's not satisfying enough. What's the other option? Well, the other option, if you wanted to study psychology, and specifically psychotherapy, is to be a psychoanalytic psychologist. Now, at this time, you had psychoanalysis was comprised of not just Freudian psychoanalysis. Freud was considered the classic Freudian psychoanalysis, as we discussed a couple lectures ago, was id-based. It was id-driven. It was based on the idea that we are compelled by unacceptable biological and nefarious drives that are unconscious to us. Naughtiness. <laughs> this is id psychology. And specifically, for Freud, things came back to a sexual conflict. The idea that of the Oedipal situation. While other people who started who started by studying Freud and identifying maybe a psychoanalyst broke off and changed this idea. The first one was Carl Jung, probably the first one was Carl Jung. Carl Jung, instead of being in, seeing the id and the unconscious as this dark negative place of bad desires, saw this as a wellspring of knowledge to understand ourselves. Instead of looking at the unconscious as something that was bad for us to to engage in uh, the unconscious was something called the shadow, is something we can learn about ourselves from. Alfred Adler were, uh, was known not as an id psycho psycho psychodynamic psychologist, but as an ego psychodynamic psychologist. He was more interested in how individuals overcome feelings of inferiority, how their ego deals with feelings of inferiority. And the answer to, to, if you study the Adlerian therapist, the question you frame is not how is this representative of a edible situation or a sexual or repressed sexual desire as Freud might have directed one. Uh, Adler would be interested in seeing it, asking always the question, how does this way of being help the individual overcome feelings of inferiority? Karen Hornai was another ego psychologist. Eric Frome, her, her lover, <laughs> they had an affair together. Eric Frome uh, looked in combining psychoanalysis and existential psychology, what we're going to study today, and humanism and Buddhist psychology all together. He was a real interesting theorist to look into. So these were the options. You had behaviorism or you had this psychoanalysis stuff. And for many people, psychoanalysis was just too deep. It went too, the, 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 the common cr criticism at the time was analysis is paralysis. Have you ever analyzed something so exhaustively that you become paralyzed, like a, like a neurosis in itself? <laughs> Looking at something so, you can get so concerned about some aspect of yourself that it becomes a neurosis to be examining it. Well, that was, that's what they mean by analysis is paralysis. So this group of analysts, psych, mostly psychoanalysts, may be influenced by Jung, may be influenced by Fromm, may be influenced by Adler and Hornai, may be influenced by another guy named Wilhelm Reich. He's an interesting character if you want to find an interesting character to look into. Um, they were all agreeing that there is something more deep, deeply involved in psychology than the reward and punishment schedules, but they were very skeptical about Freud's idea that it came down to sexual conflicts in society. Society saying no, the biological evolutionary drive saying yes, and coming to terms with those two issues or what psychologists were looking at. Instead, this group of thinkers were reading people like Soren Kierkegaard, the Danish existentialist, Christian existentialist. They're reading Friedrich Nietzsche, the German secular existentialist. 
Nietzsche and Kierkegaard talk about much the same ideas, only one is talking from a position of Christianity, and the other is talking from a position of atheism, secular. secular. What both of these thinkers held in common is what the idea of existentialism comes down to, is the idea that the core thing that we all here have to look into is the question of what it means to exist. What is existence? Maybe more specifically, what are the what are the implications of existence? Now, once you start thinking about this question, what does it mean to be to exist? The existentialists start wrestling with this to, to one degree or another. Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, and then a, a, a guy named Martin Heidegger takes over the existentialist question. And then another guy named Jean Paul Sartre, a French existentialist. And then a guy named Maurice Merleau Ponty. If you go to school in France to study psychology, to this day you will study a big, thick, tough, difficult text called The Phenomenology of Perce Perception by Maurice Merleau Ponty. Merleau-Ponty was not teaching academic experimental psychology, he was teaching phenomenological existentialism. So what are all these figures, these names I'm throwing out to you and these ideas, what is this all about? Well, the idea of existentialism, when we come to wrestle with this idea of existence, is that it's unlike Freud's proposition that we're all having to deal with psychoceptual conflict, the society of civilization tells us no, sex drive says yes, and the conflict of neurosis comes out of that. Existentialist says there's something more important than sex. Oh my goodness, there's something more important than sex. And what's more, what causes more anxiety? What causes more repressed, unacknowledged fear than sexual repression or sexual taboo? You want to have an idea what the thing that Jung said we can all not fully comprehend that this is going to happen to us. And we all treat it kind of like, oh yes, that, but in fact, we don't feel it. You got it, yes. death, mortality, right? And this is the big thing that causes the most anxiety, whether you're talking about, now listen, I ran support groups for families of obsessive compulsive disorder, not, not obsessive compulsive personality disorder, but actual OCD. And what, we, what I was uncovered or unconcealed in this year of doing this, these groups was that the people with the OCD symptoms, the people who are doing rituals and doing contamination, who do rituals not to feel that there's contaminated, it usually reduces down to a death anxiety, like a, a fear of loss of control of death. Think about your fear of snakes if you have it. They, to do a phenomenological reduction, a phenomenological investigation, not experiments, not in a laboratory, but sit down and really think about the implications of, of the fear of a snake and what that means. And why not something else? Why not a goldfish or a snake? You start playing and thinking about this in a very systematic way, a very exploratory way, and we come to terms as a loss of control, fear of death. So for existentialism, the, which is one of the main components of what we know as humanism. For existentialism, the horizon of death is the thing that gives us the most anxiety, and it's the thing that gives our lives meaning. Death, the horizon of death. So the fact that mortality, so the fact that we are all going to cease to exist. Think about all the ways people come to coping with this mortality, with death. Think about people who are artists. Perhaps they want to create art as a way of transcending death as being immortal. You look at the work of Pablo Picasso or Franz Klein, or one of these individuals, and you look at their artwork and they live forever. We're in here discussing Martin Heidegger and Friedrich Nietzsche and Soren Kierkegaard, and they're dead. You can look at the legacy of anyone's output, anyone's focus, anyone's artwork, or their thinking, or writing books. 
or whatever it is they're doing as a way of trying to transcend mortality, trying to remain present and relevant after the majority of my friends are dead. I'm friends with them because I've spent lots of time with their ideas inside their head. And each of them has their friends. So one great friend, she doesn't know me. <laughs> he does know me. But uh, at, at any rate, so mortality is the horizon of our being. That means that all of us in here at an unconscious level, so this is where the psychoanalysis kind of stuff comes into play. At an unacknowledged level, we are getting meaning from our lives through mortality, through the, the horizon of death. Maybe you have ever played one of these games? Birth to death. Let's be optimistic and say, you know, that's by life we don't know. See, this is the mystery, which adds another really exciting thing to how, how we appreciate it. The more Heidegger said that the more that the moments that someone dies in our life, as opposed to someone or a pet or a friend or a loved one, that there's this window. Have you ever noticed if you've experienced the death of someone close to you that things become very clear for about two or three? weeks or four weeks, such clarity, life gains perspective. Oh, suddenly I can see all this silliness I was wasting my time in, and everything falls into place, and life becomes restructured. That's what Heidegger would call being towards death. Being cognizant of our limited time here, and suddenly you look at the person that you get irritated with, mom or dad, boy, as I've gotten older, my parents are now Elderly, my father's just turned 81. And um, suddenly it dawns on me at a certain age, maybe not today, but at, at, at a certain age that he became, that I started to see, oh, oh, he's not going to be around. And all of a sudden, things that used to be opportunities to take out anger, or be angry, or say, be mean, or something like this, and well, we all do this with our parents. All of a sudden, it's like, oh shit, I gotta like appreciate this while he's here. And some of the things that annoyed me at the time, I kind of chuckle at. It. I, if you, I'm not thinking yet, but I'm almost. I chuckle at it and say, one day I'm gonna miss this. It still annoys me. <laughs> I mean, I answer these, yes, Dad, yes, Dad, okay, Dad, you know. But I also know simultaneously, oh man, one day I'm gonna miss this. How about if you were a pet? And you have your pet, and sudden, and you've experienced the loss of that pet. You know, the cancer diagnosis coming. You look at this little dog or cat, or whatever it is you have, or fish, and you look at this and you say, "Oh my goodness!" Suddenly, every moment is fully invested in just looking at them and enjoying the sunlight hitting them, because you know the expiration date is inevitable. And it was always there, but death sickness, suddenly it becomes real. This is the horizon of death. So the question that the existentialists want us to come to terms with, whether they're Christian existentialists or secular existentialists, the question is, you know you have a finite period of time here. You don't even know when this is. You think about this. Maybe most of the folks here are somewhere that are even here, I would guess. I'm up in here. My parents, our, your grandparents are probably up in this area somewhere. The, the rules of life are very different <laughs> over here. The rules of what's important is very different on this half of life. And on this half of life, what's meaningful? What's purposeful? How you're going to spend your time? You know, the first half of life, and this comes from Carl Jung, incidentally, but it's a common theme in existentialism. This first half of life, the sunrise, is usually focused on getting, acquiring. You're getting an education. 
making money, saving money, investing money, building up, taking, taking, taking. There's not as much of an emphasis here on giving, and there's not as much of an emphasis on attending inwardly, keeping spirituality, artistic movement. It's something else. It's about something of you know, getting action instead of this. It's a getting kind of attitude. And then suddenly around this age, there becomes a shift that begins to take place. As you know, talk about this shift the existentials. And it's a shift towards it's sh the, the meaning shifts. So here meaning is kind of an acquiring meaning. A getting meaning. Get, getting. What is if we go around the classroom I could I would imagine most of you are probably focused on what you're going to do, what you're going to become. In your dreams, your ambitions, your meaning is focused on, I'm going to be this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. Around the midlife, the meaning shifts to another focus, and the meaning becomes less about, it's because of this rising death, meaning becomes less about taking and more about giving, and more uh, or sorry, less about looking outward and accomplishing and what kind of car one's driving, etc. All these these trappings of society to, to show how successful we are, let the high school colleagues know how we've done. You know, <laughs> and go to the, go to the class reunion. That's you get a lot of that kind of stuff. High school class reunion. You get a lot of like phony baloney, inauthenticity. The, the, the humanists call it. What's inauthenticity? Inauthenticity is when you're living to keep to impress the neighbors. When you're you're distracted by distracting yourself with distraction, distracted by dis distracted from distraction by distraction. That means instead of attending to spiritual needs, to emotional needs, to looking within and coming up with a purpose and a feeling of um, meaning based on an inner guide, one distracted by watching soap opera or the, the comedy movie or watching another TikTok video. It's a distraction or taking drugs. You know, instead of silencing this stuff and taking a walk in the woods or just sitting there, you've heard this phrase, don't just sit there, do something. This is common cry in this age of life. In this half of life, the opposite is true. Just don't do something. Sit there. Sit and think, introspect, get into a state of authentic being, authenticity. And then authentic being in this state, like this has to do with spirituality, has to do with creativity, it has to do with helping others, giving to future generations, giving back to, the, to society, not a position of taking, but a position of giving. Not a position of doing something to build oneself up, Doing having meaning by nurturing the spiritual life and nurturing society, giving younger people. So this is meaning, meaning, purpose. In Christian existentialism, this is most. This is a very popular book today. I forget who wrote it, but. There's a book some evangelical wrote called A Purpose Driven Life. Have you heard of this book? It was popular. I forget who wrote it. Uh, that I, I saw an interview with the person when he wrote it, and I said, oh, he's, it's all Kierkegaard. <laughs> it's all Christian existentialism. The idea here is that without an authentic sense of purpose, you're lost. You live an inauthentic life, a vacant life. What is a vacant life? Uh, I'm going to sound like an old funny guy on this side of life, but a vacant life would be how many likes did I get on that post? How many friends do I have, you know? So an authentic life would not be how many friends do I have. An authentic life is how, what is the quality of the few friends I do have? And the word friend itself is really taken seriously as a word. <laughs> you know, being like connecting with someone in an empathic way where when their loss is your loss, where your heart aches when their heart aches, etc. Where you're joyous when they're joyous. That's an authentic thing. So this is meaning and purpose. The, the next big aspect of 
existentialism, which is one of his core ideas of humanism, or humanism is based, humanist psychology is based on, is the idea of freedom. Now here's the kicker on this one. The inauthentic individual is interested on freedom. I can do this, I'm free. We love this word free in America, freedom. Yeah. I can do this, it's my right. I have the right to do this, I'm free to do this. Don't impose on my rights. Now that is interesting, but it's only half the consideration. There's another consideration that seems to be not spoken about so much contemporarily, uh, but humanists talk about it and so do existentialists. And with freedom is responsibility. And responsibility, see, not just freedom, but freedom and responsibility is a full contextual idea of freedom. A, a full contextual, authentic way of being. Not when someone says, well, it's my right, and lift your chin up like this, and yells loudly at how you, how you might be discriminating against their freedom, or if you're not discriminating, not discriminating, but um, tethering their freedom, but instead understands that with freedom comes responsibility. A certain responsibility that transcends just me. We, this is a, a core idea in social psychology between what has all traditionally been called individualistic cultures such as our own, and our, or also it's, it's a individualistic Collectivist, collectivist, thanks. Collectivist culture. No. Collectivist culture, I'm getting all my mind's going. Collectivist culture. It's a collectivist individual. People who grow up, say, in Japan, India, China, Asian cultures, tend to have more of a balanced understanding of responsibility and freedom. Whereas in individualistic culture, we tend to have a, more of an emphasis on this. You never hear politicians running on responsibility. Platform, do you? If you do, they don't get elected. They run on a freedom. So we have freedom of responsibility. This word freedom is very interesting. There's a core concept in freedom that is unique to humanism in existential psychology. It's unique to humanism, existential psychology, and it's a foreign concept to laboratory psychology. Freedom. Free will cannot exist in the scientific field. The very nature of laboratory science, you remember you start with a hypothesis, a hypothesis, an idea. You then have a thesis which is supported by evidence. If that thesis is reliable enough, in other words, if you can get it to happen every single time you know it's going to happen, then it becomes a law. It's lawfully determined. It's called determinism. So science, by its nature, is based on the idea of determinism. Cognitive psychology is the idea that different thought systems of the mind are deterministic. You just have to figure out the algorithm. And get the, this is the foundation of artificial intelligence today, AI research. Uh, neuroscience, you've all heard of the idea of mapping the brain. The idea of mapping the brain and understanding the lawful deterministic function of neurotransmitters and cellular activity, that's determinism. The idea here is that one day the back of the watch, the neck, it will be taken off and we'll be able to understand deterministically how the mechanism works. Humanism, oh, behaviorism, lawful cause and effect stimulus response determinism. With humanism, the consideration is not that we have, you know, on one end of the spectrum, genetic determinism, biological determinism, and then on the other end of the spectrum, we have social determinism. That's the nature nurture stuff that you're all told for the past four years. You've all been told that no one thinks that way anymore. Spend some time with those people who talk about it, and you realize that they still think that way. They're just saying 60-40%. They're making room for the argument that their hearts are still very much in one hand of the other. There'll be exceptions. No 
funding section system. The majority of them, we'll, look at, we'll start to smell in the way they talk that very few of the biological determinants or, or um, social determinants, learning, which I found. So, um, it would be similar like a social psychologist versus a biological psychologist. You can even boil this, this uh, metaphor down, this symbolism down to political party. Democrats tend to think that if you increase the standard of living in someone's cult, social, cultural, economic, economic background will increase their education and their education level and their, their ability to be good citizens. Uh, that's typically a liberal point of view. Conservative point of view says it doesn't really matter how many apples and celery sticks you make available at lunch. The little kids are given the option to vote for the junk pizza. <laughs> it's biological. It's hardwired. It doesn't matter. People are given the option. There's a waste of time. Interestingly enough, the, there's the two ideologies, and we can all spend time examining what we believe in. And the really useful thing that uh, I was taught is spend time really studying what you don't believe in, and suddenly you realize you come to terms with a very big conundrum that ideology is ideology. And it might be in the, in the potato chip aisle. And you look down in the potato chip in the aisle of the supermarket, supermarket, and you walk down the potato chip aisle and you say, oh my goodness, God bless America. Look at all of these potato chips I have to choose from. But it's an illusion of choice. You're, after all, you're eating one bag of potato chips. This is what this idea of freedom and responsibility comes down to. And kind of like for an existentialist, living an authentic life is Wake of humanist existentialists is waking up to the illusion of freedom and coming to terms with what society has taught you over and over again. You have this freedom, 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 and then coming to terms with, oh my goodness, maybe I'm just like picking another brand of potato chips after all. Now, finally, once you get this, is where you get into authentic being. The authentic being. This is when you're not going to school because you want to see how powerful you're going to become and how rich you're going to become and how envious everybody's going to be of you when you have your degree and you blah, 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 all this stuff. Aren't they going to show them? That's inauthentic living. What's authentic living for humanists? Authentic living is when you turn your ears off to those societal pressures. You stop listening to mom and dad. <laughs> you stop listening to the messages that you're getting inundated with from society, social medias and all this stuff, all these messages, the billboards are these successful people on the billboards. And look at you, this is, aren't you gonna be that when you get your degree? That's nonsense, it's nonsense. That's getting sold into an inauthentic way of being. Now if you're authentic, in your heart you say, my goodness, I have such a desire to learn about psychology and philosophy. This is at the core of my thing. I, I can't wait to wake up in the morning and do this stuff. Now that's living from a place of authenticity. Now you're doing it for the right. You want to be a therapist. Like most of you, I think, want to be therapists. The fact that you want to learn about not only yourself, but then learn how to help and pass that knowledge on to other people, whether it be through teaching or through therapy, one on one, etc. And you just have this real desire not to be a therapist, but to do therapy. You see, there's difference. The person who wants to be a therapist, who, who, who's, they want to let everybody know they're a therapist. They get the license plate. The doc, so-and-so, whatever, you know, uh, Freudian or something. Uh, that person is living from a place that they're doing that to exhibit the effect that well, that could be a good thing to look into. But ultimately, a place of authenticity is when you're doing something from this completely genuine position of the desire to learn and the desire to help others, etc. You, you, you get this, right? You, you get the, the sense. And you could probably think of people you know or people in the world is that are known, and you could probably get a good sense of authentic versus inauthentic. I don't know people today. 
So I can throw out a couple people that I really believe come from an authentic place that you might know. Um, one person who pops to my mind that I'm very much interested in is Jeff Goldblum. You know the guy who was the, the actor Jeff Goldblum? Jeff Goldblum seems to me to be a person who's coming from a place of authenticity. I think that his great success and fame and all that, and those nice trappings that he had in life, I think regardless of those things, he'd still be doing exactly what he's doing now. Maybe not as a famous person, but I think that he does this not for the social rewards or the financial rewards. I think he does what he does because he loves what he does. Why do I say this? Well, partly because in, for, it turns out for his entire career, He's been maintaining his daily practice of the piano. His first love is jazz piano. And I don't know if you all know this now, but he's, he put his acting career on hold, and he's been releasing CDs with his quartet, and he travels all over the world performing jazz at clubs. He's, but the thing that's interesting is this. He loves making music with other people and for other people. The fascinating thing to me is that he's been doing this the whole time. Just no one knew about it. He'd be filming a movie. He'd fly back to his weekly gig in California at this club with his little, with his quartet, his group, and then he'd fly back to the filming. He gets up every morning and he practices his his jazz piano. Now, to me, I see this and I say, "Oh, this is somebody who's living from a place of authenticity." You can probably find people that you know in your generation that are. Probably that you're living from a place of authenticity. And perhaps I'm completely off on this. Maybe you're just completely authentic and consuming. I don't know. But I like to, if I had to put my guess, I think that I think he'd be I think he'd be following his bliss even if he weren't famous and rich. So for this humanistic idea here, this existential idea, freedom, meaning, finding meaning, and choosing to do this having the freedom to direct one's life towards that chosen goal or cho the calling, as Kierkegaard and Christian existentialists call it, call it, what am I called to do? Well, for Christian existentialism, the calling comes from God. God has called you to be a doctor, a psychologist, a preacher, an artist. You know, bless you since we're in the Christian, Christian existentialism, God is calling you to, to fulfill this meaning in your life. In secular existentialism, the calling doesn't come from God. The calling comes from your unconscious. You have to listen closely and transcend society. <laughs> tap into the, Jung calls us the unconscious. Tap into that wellspring of creativity. And that's when you start being authentic. I'll get into them here. Finally, oh, by the way, free will. You won't encounter free will in laboratory. Cognitive psychologists have largely sealed the fate on, on neuroscientists. Free will is something that can exist if you believe in scientific experiments. This is one of the reasons that you'll learn that humanists don't do lab psychology. Humanists don't feel that human beings can be studied through experiments. Not because they're humane, that's not what humanism means. Humanism means that the human condition is so profound and so complicated that it's beyond what laboratory experimentation can uncover. And so if you want to read a book that will blow your mind and no one talks about anymore, Abraham Maslow, you know, he's the famous, one of the famous humanists. Abraham Maslow wrote a book called Not the Science of Psychology, but The Psychology of Science. And he goes through and he dissects the scientific mindset that treats human beings as objects that can be measured and lawfully, deterministically studied with IQ scores and trait scores and all this stuff. And what Maslow points out is that the main issue here is that scientists have one tool, especially scientific psychologists, lab psychologists. They have one tool, and that tool is a hammer. If the only tool you have in your tool set is a hammer, and every problem you approach is going to look like a nail. That 
if you've heard that quote before, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem will appear like a nail. That comes from Maslow's book, The Psychology of Science. And he states in this book that this is one of the downfalls of laboratory academic psychology, that they're treating everything in the human condition like it can be scientifically understood in, in a deterministic way. Everything is approached with a hammer and being forced to fit into that model. And this is why humanists say, no, we don't do experimental Research, that's good for physics maybe, or chemistry or biology, but not for the human condition. The final consideration, time is it? Holy moly, what timing. The final consideration that the, ooh, the existentialists talk about is uh, a number four. And this is the big one for, if you've heard of Camus and Jean-Paul Sartre, No Exit is his famous play. By the way, Jean-Paul Sartre was a French existentialist who is interested in this big thing here. Absurdity. And I'm going to also include in this isolation. Isolation is coming, to, more importantly than absurdity, isolation is coming to terms with the fact that we come into this, we're thrown into this situation with a hand of cards that we didn't ask for. And we come in alone, completely alone. Now what we do with this, isol what we do, how we manage that isolation, we can try to say, oh, now I'm married, now I'm secure, now I'm safe. 50% of the time, I guess that's true, or 40% of the time, I don't know what it's down to. I think many people have given up on this illusion of safety. Some people are, are work it out and they, they, they maintain this. They choose to go about things in a way that it lasts a long time, these companionships. Other people brag about their 60 years together and they've been 60 years of hell together. Congratulations for that success. You know, but they're very proud about how many years they've been together, and it, you know, meanwhile she's getting beaten up, and who knows what else is going on? We see a lot of this illusion. But isolation, how do we come to terms with isolation? So it's not uncommon. The good news is, for those of you who might struggle with what I'm about to describe, is as you get older, it gets easier. Hopefully, I hope that's true for everyone in here. It's been so in my experience. When we're younger, we, we seek to get rid of that feeling of isolation with uh, maybe neurotic, neurotic ways we mistake love, that feeling, loopy feeling, oh, I'm in love, and chase after that, when in fact, the humanist, the existentialist tell us, we've been misled, and the people that could probably be your best companion to help you through, uh, help each other through isolation, are probably people that you're overlooking right now. The people that you see and say, oh yeah, but we're just friends. That might be the right person to have that 60-year non-isolation companionship with. But we get kind of caught up in the, the loopy feeling. Oh, we go, okay, and then that lasts you know, six months to a couple of years, and it burns out, and then we're confused. And we're, we, we, this is interesting. So coming to, to, to terms with coming into the world completely alone and leaving the world completely alone, Christian existentialism solves this problem with Jesus. God will never fail you. You always have that prayer you can say, or that Father in the sky who never betrays you. Jesus, the boyfriend. Some people get crushes. They call German called Schwammerei. Crush. And have you ever seen someone who has like a crush on Jesus? And they, 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 they talk about Jesus with a G. Jesus. You know, you see this. You, you get you see this a lot in like the certain sects of Christianity. So this is all coming to ideas of isolation. Absurdity is the idea that ultimately we're floating around in a ball of mud in a meaningless, seemingly meaningless existence. And the only way to come, to, I, I should have included this up here, the meaning of absurdity. It's more like an opposite of meaningless absurdity. The idea here is that we 
come to terms with uh, creating meaning and out of absurdity, or finding meaning in Christian exegetical out, out of the absurd. Just to, to, that's the sealing the bow on existentialism. The other word that I use over and over again, phenomenological existentialism, which is also a part of humanism. Humanism mostly follows and focuses on existentialism, but the idea of phenomenology, it just furthers the, the idea that you can't study human experience through stimulus response objectivity. So phenomenology simply means this. There's no, if you're being taught a psychology that's, that eliminates the subjective, that's the error. Because the thing that you have to study in human psychology is the subjective. That's the point of human psychology. That's the point of phenomenology. Not getting rid of the experience and focusing on the view from nowhere, you know, this objective view, but actually coming to terms with and examining the psychology of one's subjective experience. That's a good entrance. There's, it's a little more complicated than that, but that's probably a good way to at least approach phenomenology. That's it, everyone. <laughs> Any questions or thoughts? Just squeeze that into the period. Next week, we do the cognitive revolution. And then I didn't have this on the syllabus, but the, 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 I didn't realize we were having a lecture, but I'm now corrected. I guess we do have a lecture after that, and I'll do. I'm going to teach you neuroscience and what actually is going on with brain imaging and brain scans, and what give you a little taste of this when you see that image in the, the Mars magazine or the newspaper article and it shows an area of the brain lit up, you're not actually seeing the brain image of one person. You're seeing a mathematical composite of hundreds of people that are mathematically in, implanted into this image. It's not a real one person brain in, in most of the research. So that's just a taste of verbal like, the kind of things I'm going to teach you. What does neuroscience actually capable of? What, what is it not capable of so far? Have a nice time. Enjoy the weather. <laughs>